Hello, I'm Landis, and welcome back to Perfect Date. Sandra it is. Chapter 6 I step off the boat and onto Cat Island. I'm full of anticipation about what my first day will bring. Eight hours, one journal, and a wild cat chase later. So apparently this first day brings physical assault and the biggest trauma of my life. Oh, it's awake. Human, we need to talk to you. Save it. I know how this goes, fluffy bum, blah blah blah, catification. We did this last time. Um, no, not really. Wow, you really did do yes. Front to back. A yes. Okay, so we've done all that before. It's occurred to me that it's possible we are getting shots and dying as a punishment for not succeeding with the cats. Because technically we've succeeded three times, but we turned one down. The second time, we didn't finish the research. We got fired. But the third time, we did everything we were supposed to. And we became a cat. So I think we've colossally messed up in this playthrough. But we shall find out. Don't give the game away. Oh shit, sorry. Who the hell? Someone needs to take that phone away from Mason. The rest of the day is uneventful. Just working in the lab with the professor. Stats. Ooh. Cannot wait to start unpicking this mystery. I suppose the cats might... Yeah, we did that last time. Okay. Re no, no, don't rest. Romance. Ravenpaw. Ha ha ha. Should we do the Ravenpaw? Or should we do... It's the research is the one that's going to mess up, isn't it? Yeah. Because you're not from 10. Time to release some of the kittens. Complete 15. 17 so we want to do these and not do this one hmm let's go it's time to release some of the kittens we've been holding on to I'll be sad to see the little ones go I feel like I'm buried under a mountain of samples that need to be sorted and locked some days are like this my back and neck are beginning to seize up so I decided it's time to step out and stretch my legs for a few minutes I hear the mewling of the kittens as soon as I'm out of the tent and follow the sound. Sure enough, Professor Pawpaw and Miss Marigold are at the large kitten crate. They seem to be lifting them from their crate into a transporter cage. Ah, Sandra! You finished all that work already? You really are a marvel. Actually, I'm not even halfway through. I was just taking a quick break. What are you two doing? Time to be pushed from the nest, so to speak. Oh, already? I thought it wouldn't be until next week at least. Some are faring so well it would be cruel to keep them incarcerated. They have plenty of protection out there. It's a very safe island for the most part. Some professor who's staying? Just a couple, I think. This chap for certain. He picks up the plump grey male that Trixie insisted we tag. He looks a picture of health to me, I don't understand. Really? But he looks so well. Quite advanced too. Yes, how deceiving looks can be sometimes. I feel a moment of tension in the air, and I could swear I saw a look pass between the Professor and Miss Marigold. May I ask, what's wrong with him, Professor? Yes, of course, Sandra. An inquiring mind is to be encouraged, but alas, as an overworked mind is no good to anyone. So I will go through it with you another time, when you have less on your plate. I stand for a moment like an idiot before I realise I've been dismissed. Oh yes, I really ought to get back to my cataloguing. Is that Mason? As I reluctantly make my way back to my mountain of work, I can't help feeling uncomfortable. I'll be keeping a close eye on that little furball. That's a nice and quick and easy one. Yay! 17. Here we come. Uh, what time is it? Is that the catalogue going off? Okay. Ooh. 
I am awoken by the sound of the catalogue receiving a message. I squint under my pillow to see Mr. Marigold's name light up on the screen. His texts are still rather cryptic. I wonder if he knows I figured out that he's the mysterious messenger. I decide not to tell him for the foreseeable future. Those three little kittens are so small and helpless. I don't think they would stand a chance without you to protect them. Keep a watchful eye, Cat Nanny. He's referring to the three kittens that Professor Pulpo decided to hold back when he let the others back into the wild. Why would Mr. Marigold be interested in the kittens? So it wasn't Mason. Either way, I have learned to take these messages seriously, so I make a note to check on them in my lunch break today, just to be sure everything's alright. I decided to take my lunch to the lab. Mrs. Marigold let me make a sandwich out of some leftover ham from last night's meal. Hello, my lovelies. Here you are. One, two, three. All snoring peacefully. I feel relieved and a little foolish for worrying. I suppress my childless giggle and open one of the cages to give the tag kitty a cuddle. Hello, sleepy pants. Carefully stroking with my finger as he continues to snooze in my hand. Oh, what's this? A finger runs over a little rough lump on the back of his neck. His list is a small squeal from the plump grey kitten. My heart stops on my chest and I quickly move him to the examination table. Gently blow his soft fur out of the way and catch a glimpse of a bright red gash between his shoulder blades. He was too young to be tagged. It's got infected. With trembling hands I reach my catalogue to scan his tags so I can erase the information before I remove the chip. Cat scan failed, no tag found. We'll try again. Scan failed, no tag found. Uh oh. Well, we can't go any further with that for now, but that's. Well, uh, no. No, I have more to do. I'm not risking that just yet. Recon. Number three. Mr. Marigold knows something that I don't. I need to follow him and find out exactly what it might be. I have a feeling I won't like it, though. Today is my day off, and I'm trying to stay out of sight. The professor doesn't like me being around the camp on my downtime. Don't know why, but he's always pushing me off to explore. He really wants time without me around to get on with things he'd rather I didn't see. Maybe I'm being paranoid, but he definitely seems shifty to me. So today I have a plan. It means I have to hang around until Mr. Marigold does his mid-morning errands. I'm trying not to be seen. I don't have too long to wait. It's like clockwork every day at this time he leaves the camp carrying a large bag, and he doesn't return until an hour later. I have offered to help him a couple of times, but I've always met with stonewalling. This is the day when I find out what he's up to. I let him get a bit of a head start and then begin to follow. I try to use my new catification properties to my best advantage. Stealth, nimbleness, agility. I'm so much fitter than when I arrived on the island. My eyesight and hearing are fantastic. He's headed into the forest, as I suspected he would. That makes it so much easier for me to go unnoticed. We travel for about 10 minutes at a good pace into the densest part of the wooded area. Finally, he stopped up ahead, and I could see a type of shack, covered in creepers and ivy that made great camouflage. You really wouldn't notice this place from any kind of distance. Outside the hut, he bends down. I think he's picking something up. Then he disappears inside. I bide my time, finding a good out-of-the-way hiding place. After a short while, he re-emerges. Bends down again, then straightens up before setting off the way he came. That's a key he's getting. When I'm satisfied that he's not going to return, I gingerly make my way to the shack up close. I can see it's steadier structure than I thought, and the door is locked. I bend down as he did and start looking for a key. It's pretty obvious. There's a large flat stone in front of me. I lift it a little and slide my fingers under the edge. I feel it instantly. I put the key in the lock and take a deep breath, unsure of what I'll find in here. I open the door. It's dark. There are no windows. Just a small skylight letting in enough light to see that there are lamps. Obviously powered by solar panels on the roof. I turn on one. It takes me a moment to understand what I'm looking at. It's dirty and dingy. There are shelves along two of the walls that have cages, and the cages are housing cats. There is an eerie silence. None of the cats are making a sound. I go up to one of the cages to check if they're even alive. Hello, Kitty? There was a small cat that I would judge to be between 10 and 14 weeks old. 
Its eyes are open but vacant and so it doesn't see me. I go to the next cage, another youngster, and another. My stomach lurches as I realise that these are kittens from the camp that had been released. No! What are they doing to you? Why are you in here? I turn to the other wall and I'm struck dumb by what I see. More small cats, but in different stages of distress. One has an eye bandage, and the other eyes weeping with pus. Another has more of the fur on its back shaved, where there is an open sore. Another has a bandaged leg too short, as though its paw had been amputated. I begin sweating. Breathing is difficult. I need to get out. I stumble towards the door and fall to my knees outside. I gulp in the cool air and try to focus my thoughts. This is the strongest proof so far that there are secret tests being carried out on the cats. Tests that Professor Pawpaw doesn't want me to know about. Are they all in on it? The Marigolds are, obviously. But what about Zane? Do I dare mention it to anyone? I need more information first. When I've gathered myself sufficiently, I re-enter the Hell House and try to find some paperwork. Anything that might explain what's going on here. I look through the drawers of the filing cabinet in the corner and pull out some of the folders. I switch on another lamp and sit on the floor and begin reading. There are experiments, obviously, but for what? The data suggests that a large number of chemical substances have been tested on these subjects. Instead of the usual catalogue of blood and tissue samples tested to evaluate the cats, data is all related to the chemical compounds. They're what's being tested. Some of the records go way back. Years of data. As I put the papers back, I see the waste products bin. I remove the lid. And it's almost entirely full of empty ketamine bottles. So that's why there's no sound. These animals are drugged out of all lucidity. I don't know if you can hear me, or even if you understand me, but I'm making a promise to you all that I will get to the bottom of this, and I will help you whatever it takes. You will be well and free again. Hold tight, kittens. I will be back. I feel terrible leaving them there, but I know it would be foolish to arouse suspicion until I know what I'm dealing with. I make my way back to the camp with a heavy heart, but with fierce determination. Oh, that's a bit distressing. Distressing as fuck. Looks like Trixie was right. Oh, wait, no. Twos again. No trippy dreams, please. Yeah. Oh, dare I go further. I'm off exploring the island today with Kibbles and a certain charming Irishman. Irish cat. Yay. It's a beautiful day. The sun isn't too hot, which is lucky as I'm going walking with Kibbles and McMurphy. They've been excited to show me something for the past week. This is the first proper break I've had. We're heading further into the forest than I've been before. So where exactly are we going, chaps? No idea, Car. Why are you following Kibbles? Hmm. I was just following Sandra. But you're both in front of me. How could I have been leading? Go on, trouble yourself, Car. We're not in any rush today. Just as I'm about to reply, something catches my eye. I instinctively move towards it. In this distance, it looks like black swaths have been cut into the ground. Guys, what's this? Kibbles and Murphy. You've already wandered some way off, rejoin me and the three of us stand looking at what appears to be some kind of runway. Skid marks! Of course. I thought it was a runway, but you're right. Well, come on, me amigos. Where's your sense of adventure? Murphy has already disappeared into the thick overgrowth that's shrouding whatever it is that the marks lead to. Oh. Kippers and I follow the sound of Murphy's voice and find ourselves in a small clearing. My goodness. Wow. Is it a fighter? Damn. Looking at the wreckage of a crashed two-man biplane. Most of it is covered with vines. Another forest grove, but the front half at least seems to be mostly intact. This looks like it's been here some considerable time. Strange how we'd never come across it before, eh, Kibbs? Nothing about this island surprises me anymore. Well, maybe we'll want to see some dead guys. Math, help me out. Murphy is silent. There's something in his jaws that appears to be caught in the broken propeller. He's pulling on it. It looks like some kind of rag. 
McMurphy. What is that? McMurphy has freed the cloth and is now sitting with it hanging from his mouth. He's silent and still, as though lost in thought. What's up, Murph? What's with the manky scarf? And I can see it now. It is a scarf, old and filthy, but it looks like it was once the type of white scarf a pilot would have worn. You okay, McMurphy? Uh, what's that car? He's barely present. The scarf. Is it important? Well, I'm not sure. Stop being weird, Math. Gibbs. Shh. Feels like something I should know. Or remember. Remember? Have you seen it before? Maybe. A long time ago before here. I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Before I came here, Car. You don't think I was born on this island, do you? Well, you might as well have been, considering how little you remember from before. It's all going grandad fading away to oblivion. Kibble's banter seems to have brought McMurphy back from whatever he was dreaming about, and I'm relieved to see the twinkle return to his eye. Okay then, Mr. Smarty Pants, how did you get here? It's not an interesting story, and I don't want to bore anybody. Yeah, that's what I thought. Right, car, let's go. Murphy and Kibbles head back the way we came. I stand stunned for a second, watching them go. Now, guys? But they've lost interest. They've already moved on. Look back at the record and realise there's nothing I can do here on my own. I'll have to come back at some point with Floofy, but it's exactly the sort of thing he'd love to help me investigate. Huh. Ooh. We are learning. So the last thing we're after is from what's her face? A raven paw. So let's get the raven romance going. It should be interesting because she's locked up in a cage. Ravenpaw's health has made some heartening improvements lately. So much so that the professor and I decided she didn't need to be in isolation anymore. It could be moved to the lab for further treatment. As I prepare the salve with my pestle and mortar, I'm distracted by a tiny plaintive sound. I turn around and Ravenpaw is curled up in a cage, motionless. As I resume my work, there it is again, and then I realise she's humming. Is that you? I thought you were asleep. Hmm? Oh, sorry. I didn't realise I was humming out loud. What is that tune? Oh, it's just the song my mum used to sing for me. I um, it sometimes to get to sleep. Sounds lovely. Maybe if you taught it to me, I could sing it to you when you're feeling poorly. Ravenpaw frowns at me and buries her face under her paw. Can't sing. I disagree. I bet you have a lovely voice. No. I put my tools down and go over to her. Well, maybe you'd like to listen to some songs instead. I believe this has a music library. Take the catalogue from my lab coat pocket. Uh, let me see. How do I work this thing? I haven't used this function before. I fumble with the options until a song called Summertime begins to play. How about this? What is that? It's by Soft Summer. Do you like it? It's catchy, right? It's making me want to claw my eyeballs out of my skull. Ah, let's turn this off then, shall we? Frantic fiddle about with the catalogue until the music stops. Kind of want to let him have his moment. <laughs> Can't see, but I'm dancing. <laughs> I think my ears might actually be bleeding. Oh, gosh. I'll get the octoscope and some cotton buds. Not literally, your donkey. <laughs> donkey. All right, of course. You were making fun of me. I've never seen Ravenpaw be so open. It's great. She's inching out of her shell, but I'm not sure how best to react. Well, I think I can download more music onto this thing. What would you like to listen to? It's okay. You don't need to waste your data on me. It's not a waste if it'd make you happy, Ray. Go on, you must have a favourite band. Ravenpool goes quiet, lost in thought, until finally she mumbles her response. The Mad Catters, high tea. 
I don't want to seem uncool by admitting that I've never heard of the Mad Catters, let alone any of their songs. So I give her a knowing nod and start searching the music app. I'm not sure I like this one. Be myself. Oh wow, this is loud. Yeah! Ravenpaw smiles and closes her eye in appreciation. I sit awkwardly waiting for the racket to end. Ravenpaw looks totally relaxed, her shield slightly lowered. Finally the screaming stops and I hurriedly put my catalogue back into my lab coat pocket before she can ask me to play something else. Not for you then. I, j I just don't get it, my ears just heard racket, sorry. Don't be, it's good we're all unique. So, cards on the table time. All time favourite song? Oh, there are too many. You probably wouldn't like any of them anyway. That's not the point. It's your taste, not mine. I showed you mine. Okay. It will always be a Bowie song. Respect. Really? You like him? How could you not? I think it would have to be off the album Hunky Dory. Choice. Which song? Feeling flushed with success. This is going better than I could have imagined. Kooks. Cute. Of course, if you stay with us, you're going to be pretty kooky too. I'm delighted she knows it. Maybe I'm a little bit cool after all. I'll see if I can download some of his stuff next time. Don't, because then I need to mute the audio. Is that it then? I'm afraid so. I should probably get back to work. Ravenpaw looks dejected. If that's okay? Yeah, whatever. I go to resume my work, but the black cat lets out a small sound. Hey! Hmm? You, you said you said you would sing to me. I feel myself go cold and self-consciousness engulfs me, but I try my hardest not to show it. Well, yes, if you'd like. If you really want to, I suppose I wouldn't mind. I clear my throat and feel myself begin to blush. So what shall I sing? Any favourites? I don't know. What did your mum used to sing to you? Oh, crikey. She used to sing lots of things, but I don't know if I can remember any of them. Let me think. Oh, I know. Bounce little baby on my knee, soft and pink and chubby. When you awake, you'll have your tea and a bath, so you're not so grubby. Dream little baby on my lap, hap, 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 happy. Here is a kiss for your sweet nose, and now I'll change your nappy. Okay. As I sing, I notice Ravenpaw visibly relax. She stretched out a bit, and I realise it's the first time I've seen her uncurl herself. Although there's plenty of room in her crate, she's always a tight little ball of fur in the corner. When I finish singing, she opens one eye. That was traumatic. You should probably get back to your work now. Rude. Ravenpaw makes a small squeaky sound I've not heard her make before. Are you okay? Yes. She's laughing. And so are you. I think at this stage, most of the voices are starting to all blend in together. Right. More romancing. What's the point? Hopefully we can get a succeed here. Without dying. In the lowest drawer, right at the back. No, I can't find it, Ray. You sure it wasn't in the cupboard? No, it's there. Keep reaching. It might have slipped down the back. You're choking, right? My hand can't squeeze. Oh, hang on. I feel something nestled just under the bottom of the drawer. I think I've got it. If I could just try inching it up out of the space behind the drawer, but it keeps slipping. Just take the drawer right out. It won't come out. Something is jamming it. Well, give it a yank. Ray, it doesn't work like that. I don't want to break the cabinet. Wait, if I try feel around the side walls of the cabinet for any blockages... My hand finds a cold protrusion. Ah, I think I found the perpetrator. I wiggle the offending item loose and pull my hand out to inspect what's in it. To my surprise, it's a bottle of nail polish in a muted, dusty pink colour. I decide not to ponder why exactly there is a bottle of nail polish stashed away in the lab and focus instead on the task at hand. The drawer slides out with ease now, and I'm able to retrieve the book. Thoughts and Verse by L. Rutherford. Who's L. Rutherford? 
Ravenpaw casts her eyes down at the four paws. One of the research assistants before you found this book somewhere along the beach. She used to read me some of the poems. We never worked out who the author was, but we think they probably came from the shipwreck. Ah, Sally. It's the first time that I've considered that other humans on the island may have had their own relationships with my cats. I don't like to think about it, and I'm not sure why. Look through the little brown book. The writing is very faint, but still clear enough to read. About half the pages are filled with neat words written in ink, and then suddenly it's blank. He didn't finish it, I suppose. I like the one on page three. It's really dark. Ravenpaw seems more lively than usual today. I hope that means she's getting a better, or at least getting used to me. When darkness advances and silent makes its retreat, the sand begins where beach and forest meet. Yowling and hissing, and awful cries, then like stars in the blackness, the thousands of eyes. Sea's fierce temper seems kinder than here, the hell full of danger and hardships and fear. There's a long pause. Hmm, I wonder what it means. Are you backward? Well, I know it's describing the island, but I wonder what happened to the author. It sounds rather distressing. Rather distressing? Ugh. You humans can be so exhaustingly repressed sometimes. Just think about it. Imagine this place, this island, before the clumsy humans cut a swath through it and claimed it for science. Before your cosy tents and generated some protective gear. All that time ago, mysterious and overgrown, terrifying branches, twisting up in the blackness like monstrous golems. The yowling of unidentified animals endlessly boring into your brain throughout the night, making sleep impossible. No friendly little brook to bathe in, nothing to soothe your gnawing pain of starvation. The filthy, baking heat of the day, the relentless cold of the long night, the slow dawning realisation that there's no escape. This is where the journey ends. This is the final destination. Hell on Earth. It's obvious that Ravenport has thought about this poem a lot. I feel bad for being so insensitive. And human. It must have been horrific. Yes. Hmm. Well, she's dark, so let's not lie. You really put yourself in her shoes as though you were there. I admire that. How else are you going to understand? I'm a scientist. I'm trained to stand back and observe, be impartial. But if you keep a distance, you'll miss the detail. Oh, I don't know. It's about proximity as much as location. Sometimes I have to get up very close, even microscopically close. I'm still on the outside looking in. I see the finest of details. I don't think that's what you're talking about, is it, Ray? You mean getting inside, to the heart of it? Yes, I suppose so. It's the cue or innuendo, the essence of something that defines what it is. That's not always obvious from the outside. Well, it's very obvious in this poem. I wonder why I wanted to shy away from it. I'm not brave like you. Are you kidding? Or fishing for compliments, maybe? I feel my face get hot. Yeah, I wasn't. I'm playing. You have plenty of courage. You came here to this island. Not everyone would. You've held up well under very difficult conditions. Then there's the whole... Rawr, cat monster rawr, thing. I'm taken aback by a sudden impression and it makes me laugh. How's that going, by the way? I shrug my shoulders. Sometimes if I make a little progress on the antidote, I feel really fine with it. But... But if something I'm trying fails or progress slows down, I have sleepless nights making myself sick with worry. Then there are times when I forget about it altogether. How can I complain when I see what you guys have to deal with? We're silent for a while. It's not uncomfortable. Eventually, it's Ray who breaks it. I'll go on then. What? Well, I know you're just dying to read a funny one. Not really. But there is a little limerick that I thought was hilarious. She rolls her big eyes and smiles. Okay, here goes. There was a young duck swab named Davy, whose hair was exceptionally wavy. I asked him to tell Prey what's got in that way. He answered, "'Tis drinking me gravy." She cannot help but laugh at the awfulness of it, and we both keep laughing till we have tears in our own eyes. I suppose I ought to be making tracks. Okay, but would you just read me the lullaby one as I fall asleep, please? Yes, I like that one too. I lay out here and watch the stars. 
when all the world comes clear to me. The patterns soothe my battle scars. They show I'm where I'm meant to be. And while the sea is kind to me, and rocks me in my slumber, and all the stars, the nears and fars, overwhelm me with their number. I think of you, the brightest star, lost so young, gone so far. And when my final day is done, I'll follow to the place you've gone, and back together you and I will brighten up another sky. I look down at the softly snoring cat. She looks so peaceful. Ooh, it's a plot thickens. If you enjoyed this video, then tickle the like button, perhaps subscribe, and check out the rest of the channel. And why not join us on the Facebook, Twitter, Discord, and Patreon? Links are in the description, and rolling through the credits right now. I've been Landis. This has been Perfect Date. Thank you very much, and see you soon.